This is the fourth week of a series we've had on parables of Jesus. Parables are stories, illustrations that help us to be able to understand a spiritual truth. And Jesus often spoke this way. It's interesting, and I was looking back this week and just looking again at parables and came across a verse in Matthew 11 where Jesus says to his disciples, do you know why I'm speaking to you in parables? He asks them this. Now, of course, we think, well, it's because, you know, object lessons help. One of the great things about Ken being up here doing the children's sermon, she usually has some sort of object lesson. And, you, and with kids, they can look at something concrete, and they can maybe help them bridge to something that's more abstract, that's spiritual. And it's a great way to learn. But Jesus didn't say, I'm teaching you these things because you need a bridge from the, from the concrete to the abstract. He says, I'm teaching you in parables for two things. One is so that those who are hearing, that have ears to hear, will be able to grasp it. He says, I'm telling you these stories and giving you these examples and illustrations so that the spiritually minded, those that have ears to hear, will be able to grasp it. But also so that those who could care less won't grab it. That seems like a strange thing for Jesus to say. He says, I want to hide these things from those who could care less about what we're talking about here. You know, we tend to think Jesus wants everybody to know every, all the truth. But he said, these things are so priceless. These things are so important that I want those that have ears to hear to grab them. But the people who don't, I don't want them wasting their time with this. I don't want to waste this precious truth on ears that are just going to take it and just throw it on the ground and stomp on it and squish it out. He goes, these things are so valuable that I want them to be brought right to the ears that need to hear that. I thought that was really interesting. That's why Jesus spoke with parables. First of all, to let those that need to hear, hear it, and those that don't need to hear, to not hear it. And I pray that as we've gone through the parables, that we would be able to be ears that receive God's word and God's truth and take it to our hearts. Often, Jesus didn't even explain his parables. Sometimes he would explain it. Sometimes he would just give it for what it is. And it's up to us to listen to the Holy Spirit to say, this is what this means. Some things are more obvious, some things are rather hidden. But if we ask God, he shows us what do these things mean even without all the detailed explanation. Well, over the last few weeks, we've looked at several parables, not every parable that Jesus spoke in, but some of them, especially as it pertains to the kingdom of God. We talked about the first week, the parable of the soils, that there's different kinds of soil that receive the message of God in different ways. And we talked about four different kinds of soils, and hopefully the soil that's fruitful will take God's word. It'll build into their lives, and grow something beautiful, fruitful out of it. The second week, we talked about the value of the kingdom of God, that it's like looking for a hidden treasure, that we'd be willing to sell everything we had to go and get that piece of ground where that treasure is buried, because it's worth everything. It's worth anything. And that the truth of God, we will sacrifice anything that stands in the way of us being able to grasp that. And so we were challenged with the value of the kingdom of God. Last week, we talked about the growth of the kingdom of God. How does the kingdom of God grow? And we talked about how it starts out as a little seed. And just how little bitty seeds can grow into big trees. And how one little seed can produce something that will produce even thousands and multitudes of seeds beyond it. The potential for growth is just astronomical. Astronomical. And the opportunities we have to see God's kingdom, it starts small. It starts small in each of our hearts. It starts small in our towns. It starts small in our world. But it grows into something big. And that's what God's promised to do. And we get to be a part of that and see it grow. And today we're going to talk about, well, how do we take that kingdom of God and show it to the world around us? How can we display it to the world? How can people out there that have no clue that the kingdom of God exists, grasp it with the help that God does through us. So we're going to look at that. 
But first of all, let's just talk about a little bit about what is the kingdom of God. I probably should have done this the first week to make sure we're all on the same page with that, but I'm going to do it now. The kingdom of God is not a political kingdom. God's not setting up something on the earth where he's going to be the president and everybody just has to live by the Ten Commandments and the rules of the land that's in the Bible and everybody has to go to church and pay their, their offerings like taxes to Uncle Sam. He's not setting up anything like that at all. He's not even just setting up a society where, oh, everybody's just Christians and everybody's just following God and doing the right things. He said, I'm doing something more than that. I think one of the great passages about the kingdom of God we find in the Old Testament book of Daniel. In chapter 7, verses 14 and verse 18, it says that to him, to God, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and forever and ever. You know, God's got a kingdom where he is, he's king. But he also sets up a kingdom where he says, look, for you, the saints of the Most High, that's you and me. He goes, I'm giving the kingdom to you as well. What kind of king gives his kingdom away to all his subjects? We don't see that in history at all. The king takes for himself. The subjects have to serve and work and give the best to the king. But not in this kingdom. God gives the best to all of us. He shares it with us. And it's our kingdom that we get to be a part of forever and ever and ever. I love those verses. Those are just so powerful and strong and give me hope that my life can be part of something so much bigger than just me and my day-to-day -day life. And I hope that that encourages all of us as well. During the next two weeks when we talk about the glory of God, you know, we have a king, we have a, the head of this kingdom that is so wonderful and superior and majestic that sometimes we don't even grasp that. And hopefully the next couple of weeks we'll try to just shine some light on who God is. And hopefully we can walk away going, wow. There is glory to God. It's, it's amazing that word glory is all over our Christian lingo. And I think just we don't even, we just say it, we don't even think about it very often about what it means. But God, even though he shares his glory with us and that kingdom with us, it, what we do is we, we just reflect it right back to him. He gives it to us, we reflect it back. He gives it to us, we reflect it back. I mean... That's the pattern that we keep going. And we got to understand God's glory and how to give him that glory. And we will be able to do that a little bit more looking at that the next two Sundays. So invite somebody to come along so they can get a glimpse of the glory of God as well. I hope that excites you, the glory of God. Hopefully you don't hear that and go, oh, that sounds boring. Man, if it does, go home and have a heart check. Say, God, what am I missing out on? What is there about God's glory that's so hidden from me that I'm just not sure that... I even can see it or want to see it. Start praying this week. That's my prayer, is that we'll come with hearts ready to see God's glory in new ways. But in the meantime, Jesus said about his kingdom, when he told his disciples in Luke 17, he says, when being asked by the Pharisees, well, he was being, Jesus was being asked by the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them. He said, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is where? In the midst of you. This phrase, in the midst of you, in the language that Jesus spoke back then, it can be translated different ways. Sometimes it's translated, it is within you. Sometimes it's within your grasp. But no matter which way you kind of look at it, it's obvious the kingdom of God is something that's right here. It's right here with you and me. We can hold on to it. It basically envelops us. It's within us. That's where the kingdom of God is. It's not set up in a church. It's not set up in any denomination of a church. It's not set up in any sort of network of churches. It's set up in the hearts of those who follow Jesus. That's where the kingdom of God is. 
And if you have received Jesus Christ, if you trust that through faith and repentance you come to him and say, what he's done on the cross has meaning for me, and you've exchanged that dead heart, that dead soul for the life of Jesus Christ inside of us and the power of the Spirit, then the kingdom of God is inside of us. And if the kingdom of God is inside of us, then how are people out there going to see it and know it's there? I mean, we definitely can't see inside each other's bodies. We can't see inside each other's souls. So therefore, how are we going to display it? How are we going to show it? And that's what we're going to look at today. And Jesus said a couple things about that. The first one is in Mark 4, 21 and 22. Jesus said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. This is where the song comes from. Put it under a bushel, no. I'm going to let it shine, right? Okay. Jesus says, we have a light. What does a light do? It shines. You don't put it under that bushel basket. You don't put it under your bed. You put it up on a stand. You put it up where everybody could see it. And as even we try to teach little kids, you have a light inside of you that God's put there. and You need to let it shine. Coming from this verse. God's put a light inside of us. To let it shine. And you may say well. I just have a little bit of light. But together we have a lot of light. We have the opportunities to be able to let that light be seen. We live in a day of age where we take light for granted. I was thinking about this this week. Preparing for the sermon. And until really in recent history, light was a very precious commodity. I mean, unless there was a flame, unless there was something there to make a light there, they didn't go around and flip switches in the old days. And some of you maybe grew up in a time when you didn't flip switches everywhere you went. You know, when the sun went down, there wasn't much you could do in the dark. I mean, I know even, at, you know, whenever the electricity goes off at home, you light the candles... And you put them around the house, but they really don't do that much. I mean, when it comes down to it, you can kind of see your way through the room. You might be able to see enough to brush your teeth, but you can't do much with the lights that we artificially put on that we don't have coming out of our 60 or 100 watt light bulbs. You know, we live in a day of age where light is not very valuable. In fact, I mean, we have the lights on in here. We don't need them on, but we have them on because that's what we do. We turn on our lights. But this world is a very dark place. And sometimes we don't even realize it's a dark place because we kind of put a lot of light on around us. We kind of stay where the people we're around are all people that have lights shining inside of them. And certainly on a Sunday morning, it's not very dark in here because we have a lot of light. The people that are here have a lot of light. You go out into certain places at school, you go into certain places at work, you go into certain places in this community, in this world, and it's pretty dark out there. And your one little light feels like a little flicker, feels like a little spark. And we all know what that's like. So we don't want to insulate ourselves so that we're not out in the dark world or we don't understand the dark world or the power of the dark world. Not because we want the power of the dark world to overtake us, which it can't, because darkness can't put out light. But light can make a difference in the darkness. God has ignited our hearts. He's put a spark inside of us that can make a difference, that will reflect the light of God in our lives. Sometimes we extinguish that spark ourselves because we're too busy to let it shine. Maybe we're too embarrassed to let it shine. Maybe we're just afraid to let it shine. Maybe we're just being lazy and we don't let it shine. And I just hope and pray, and I see it happening, and that it will keep happening more and more, that through this congregation, we would be people whose lights are shining. That when we leave this place, and we take all these lights and go out to our individual places, our homes, and our works, and our school, and every place we go throughout the week, that we would take God's light with us and let it shine where we're at. So we want to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine.
That was one of Jesus' words to us on how we can display the kingdom of God. We just let it shine out of us. Another thing he said about displaying the kingdom of God is found in Matthew 3, 52. Just one verse here. Jesus said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out his treasure, what is new and what is old. That's a very obscure parable. In fact, as I'm, even when I was looking through the parables to, to, to pick things out, I came across that and thought, I, I think I've, I've heard that before, but I don't think I've ever heard anybody talk about it or didn't, certainly hadn't read about that one. So it was really intriguing to me to be able to dig into that. This short illustration tells us about a house owner. The guests come. And what does he show them? He shows them some old things. He shows them some new things. And we actually do the same thing when guests come over to our house. You know, we point out or they point out, oh, you know, your kitchen just got painted. Or, oh, this is a new something this or that. Or we talk about the new this or that. Okay? We point those things out. Not to brag or anything, but just... It's interesting, something new. But we also like to point out something old. We look at those treasures, those, those things that have been passed down from generations past. Things that are old, things that are, have value to them, that are rare, that we don't see much anymore. And we, we comment on those things, don't we? We comment on the old, we comment on the new. Those are things that we draw attention to. Kind of the everyday stuff that doesn't make much difference, we don't pay much attention to. But there's something about something new and about something old that grabs our attention and is very interesting. And, and it talks about the scribe, a scribe who teaches, has, who's been trained for the kingdom of heaven. A scribe is a teacher in those days. A scribe is a person that could write, somebody that would take the scripture from one scroll way back then and rewrite it and be able to teach it and somebody else would come along and say okay I'm going to take your copy and I'm going to write it out and I'm going to teach it myself read it and teach it and all of us are scribes in the kingdom of God if we've been called by him we're allowed to take God's word and to live it out and to pass it on to other people and we as scribes of God's kingdom we share some old things we share some new things with the people that we are with I know he's your pastor, you know. My job up here is to point out a lot of old stuff. There are some things you're going to hear me say over and over and over again. It's not because I'm stuck on one thing or I have nothing else interesting to say or because I just, you know, want to just keep repeating the old stuff. There's just some things that are old, the old truths of God. You know, we even have the hymn, tell me the old, old story. Okay, that I love to hear because there are just some old truths that we just want to keep bringing out over and over again. We might do it in fresh ways or ways that we haven't thought of before or just ways to keep it from becoming stale inside of us. But the old truths need to keep coming out over and over and over again. Not to be redundant, not to be boring, but to be able to bring those things alive and in front of us over and over again. And so when we talk about the old truths over and over and over again, whether it's here at church, whether it's in a Bible study, Sunday school, whether it's out in your conversations with the people that you know, pass on the old truths. Don't let them become antiquated and outdated because they're not. The old truths, the core things of what we believe that make us who we are, need to keep coming out over and over again. And we as scribes of the kingdom of God are going to bring those old things out. But we're also going to bring out new things. There are so many truths in here that it just takes a lifetime to even get around to them all. I mean, even, this, even this obscure little parable. This isn't one we hear about very often. The parable of the soils, we hear that more often. The parable of the prodigal son, we hear that more often. But we need to bring out new things. There's always room for new things. And as your pastor, I'm going to Dig out some new treasures once in a while and say, let's, let's take a look at these new things that are in here that we haven't really maybe taken notice of. And you and I, as we go about our day-to-day -day life, we bring out those new treasures, those new things that we discover that God shows us. And we bring it out and we tell somebody, hey, you know what I was reading in God's word the other day? You know what God's teaching me? Man, I'm going through this situation in my life and, 
And God is right there present with me in a new way. And we can share that testimony with other people. Because those are new things that God's teaching us. And those are wonderful things to be able to draw attention to and to share. And so we, as scribes of the kingdom of God, we're going to share old truths. We're going to share new truths. And we're going to share the kingdom of God in that way. If God wanted to, he could totally take a big megaphone and he could from heaven just shout all the truth out for the whole world to hear. He doesn't choose to do it that way. But he's given us his word in a book. He's given the presence of the Holy Spirit. He's given each of us the ability to learn and to speak and to share and to apply those truths to our lives and the world around us. So let's go out there and let's share God's kingdom with those that are around us. Soak it in yourself and let it out.